afternoon, everyone. So wonderful to see you. Thank you for braving the rain to be here on this uh, very special evening. I'm Tamiko Brown-Nagan, the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Welcome to the biannual Rama S. Mehta Lecture, which focuses our attention on topics related to women in the developing world. This lectureship was established in Rama Mehta's memory by Catherine Atwater Galbraith and John Kenneth Galbraith, along with the Mehta family. The lecture is supported by the Harvard Radcliffe Class of 1973 through the Benazir Bhutto Leadership Program, so let me extend a special thanks to them. I'm also happy to welcome all the members of the Harvard Radcliffe Classes of 1973, 1978, and 1988 who are celebrating reunions this uh, week. I'm also grateful to the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our dedicated annual donors. Thank you. This afternoon, we have the pleasure of hearing from NPR international correspondent Ophabia Quist Arcton, live and in person rather than over the radio. <laughs> the title of Ophabia's lecture is both a statement of fact and a call to action. The voices of African women and girls matter deeply. And far too often, they go unheard. But it's not just the women and girls' voices that are excluded. It's also what we find in their place that we need to worry about. It's not a coincidence that we're often presented with, and sometimes too easily persuaded by, a distorted view of the African continent a view that's narrowly focused on conflict, corruption, and disease, a view that's devoid of the nuance and complexity we expect in other contexts, and a view that's frequently just plain wrong. In 2015, President Barack Obama visited Nairobi, Kenya to co-host a summit on global entrepreneurship. The choice of location wasn't an accident. Nairobi was then and is now a hub of entrepreneurial innovation in East Africa, and it boasts an inspiring community of women entrepreneurs. Yet one prominent news network covered the visit under the banner headline, Obama's trip to Kenya, a terror hotbed. The article itself wasn't much better. Tired and damaging cliches about the African continent are not limited to the news media. During the 2014 World Cup, an American airline tweeted their congratulations to the US team for its win over Ghana. The airline represented the United States with the Statue of Liberty, an iconic national symbol and a representation of universal freedom. For Ghana, a West African democracy with a population larger than Australia's, they used a giraffe. The first problem is that Ghana doesn't have giraffes. <laughs> <laughs> a fact that the Twitterverse was quick to point out. But we also should ask ourselves what it is in our discourse that would lead a marketing team to turn to any stock image of a wild animal to represent an African country. These kinds of characterizations both reflect and fuel widespread misperceptions about the African continent, which is home to over 1.2 billion people across 54 countries, including 14 that achieved economic growth rates above 5% last year. It's the work of dedicated, thoughtful journalists like Ophabia Quist Arcton that disrupt this pattern by focusing on the important, nuanced stories that often go uncovered, and by amplifying the voices of women, girls, and others we're least likely to hear, whether due to oversight, unconscious bias, or overt discrimination. Ophabia's is a familiar and a trusted voice, and one that many of us will immediately recognize she neither foregoes complexity for clarity, nor clarity for complexity. As NPR's Africa reporter, Ophabia covers social and political developments, 
the arts, culture, technology, and so much more. The breadth of her knowledge and of her work is exceptional. And a consistent thread in Ophabia's reporting is the foregrounding of lesser known stories and those of women and girls. Ophabia received the 2015 Edward R. Murrow Award for Outstanding Contributions to Public Radio, including her coverage of Boko Haram's kidnapping and exploitation of girls, which has continued long after the international spotlight dimmed. She also was a part of a team of NPR reporters who received a 2014 Peabody Award for their coverage of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Before joining NPR, Ophabia reported for the BBC on flagship programs in radio and television and covered 24 countries as head of the BBC's West Africa Bureau. She also had a stint here in Cambridge as a roving North American reporter for Public Radio International's The World. I'll welcome Ophabia to the stage in just a moment. Um, after the lecture, she'll be joined in conversation by another award-winning journalist, Marco Werman, who began his radio career in West Africa and has hosted The World since 2013. Five times a week, Marco brings world news into the homes into our homes, our cars, and our earbuds of public radio listeners across the United States and Canada. Like Ophabia, he's committed to amplifying less heard voices and little known stories. I'm so glad Marco is here with us too. Now, please join me in welcoming Ophabia Quist Arcton. Good evening, friends. Why didn't you talk to the weather gods on my behalf? <laughs> greetings, greetings from West Africa, from Dakar, where I'm based, from Ghana, where I come from, from the whole continent that is such a spectacular continent. Thank you very much, Tamika. What a wonderful, wonderful welcome for us. And it's super to be back here in Cambridge, where I spent a couple of years and learnt all sorts of snowy language, like a sprinkling of snow and digging out. I haven't forgotten, but I don't miss the snow and the cold. Thanks all for coming to this evening. Wonderful to see you. Yes, African women, African girls. What they have to say is important, but we don't hear enough of it. And I blame myself amongst reporters for not reporting enough about these important views. Women hold up half the sky. I believe that's what Mao Zedong once said, and it's so true, so true, yet too often women still do not get their due, and that's the world over. Africa, the continent I come from and where I report from is no exception. We're working on it. When Congolese gynecologist surgeon Dr. Denis Mukwege was announced with fellow Yazidi activist Nadia Murad as the latest co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize at last a week ago. It was heartening to see dozens of women and young girls cheering and ululating outside his Panzi Hospital in Bukavu in Eastern Congo. Dr. Mukwege, who has literally, surgically been fixing for 20 plus years women's vaginas after they've survived sexual violence, rape, and fistula complications, was conducting his second operation of the day when the news filtered through that the Nobel Committee had chosen him as a co-laureate of the annual Peace Prize. The women, especially of Eastern Congo, immediately owned that honor along with Dr. Mukwege. Dr. Miracle, Dr. Miracle, they call him. The man who ha has, through reconstructive surgery, stitched and repaired 
the damage inflicted on women and girls who have been sexually violated by rival armed men in conflicts in the phenomenon now dubbed rape as a weapon of war. Damage to their bodies and their psyche. These women feel now that their pain, their suffering and their troubles are being acknowledged and taken seriously. So in a perverse sort of way, perhaps they have triumphed with this Nobel endorsement of the work of Dr. Mukwege and his team, as well as a myriad women supporters, survivors of sexual violence and others. There are no doubt some of the same Congolese women who gathered together their meager resources in a potentially wealthy but pitifully poor country where the coltan used to manufacture the smartphone, which is perhaps in your pocket right now, where it's mined, they paid for a plane ticket to bring home Dr. Mukwege from overseas where he had taken refuge from Eastern Congo. That was after he was driven into exile by threats to his family and to him. He was forced to stop his work as a gynecologist and outspoken campaigner for women's rights. The women wanted Dr. Mirat back home to continue his hugely important surgical work and his unswerving, unwavering support, and they made it happen through their solidarity, their determination, and yes, their love and admiration for him. I mention the women and girls of Bukavu in Eastern Congo because these are the very people I look for and seek out when I'm reporting in Africa. And we don't hear enough about or from them. So you've got to cut through the lines of eager young men who zoom up to your microphone, all with their views, opinions, grievances, and of course their aspirations. Of course their views matter. I'm not saying they don't, but push back the masses, part those clamoring to talk and dominate the conversation, walk through the crowds beyond the thrusting youth to the back. And that's where you'll find the women in the compound or behind the pots and market stalls with babies strapped to their backs with colorful cloth and husbands to keep happy. They're busy. They have to work and they have families to provide for. They don't have time to go rushing up to reporters, but they know what's going on. They're not just talking or seeking out journalists. They're listening and assessing and monitoring. Make the effort to find these women and sometimes younger women and girls too, because they too have a story to tell. Give them time, spend time with them, and it may well be a different story you'll find to the one the young men rush to share with you in the first flush of reporting. You must make the effort to find these other voices. It's what I try to do. Like Dr. Mukwege's mainly women patients and supporters, you can sometimes be surprised, astonished by what they have to tell you. This year's Nobel Peace Prize winners as a dear friend puts it, reminds us of women throughout the ages who've been used as ways of punishing men and communities, all used for victory celebrations as the trophies of marauding men. Let me give you one example. Nine years ago, we rushed to Guinea, Guinea Conakry, on the West African coast. After hearing that human rights and peace campaigners, including many women, had gathered in the national stadium in the capital Conakry. They had come under a hail of gunfire by soldiers trying to stop them gathering and demonstrating. This happened under the short-lived watch of the military leader, Captain Musa Dadis Kamara. What later emerged was as one doctor told journalists, her voice trembling, a view echoed by many, many other Guineans we spoke to. C'était du jamais vu. This is unheard of in Guinea, unprecedented. 
Never before have we witnessed such brutal acts, she told. The doctor said, I have never seen such violence in my life. This is the first time we have witnessed women's bodies being treated like battlefields in Guinea. It goes against our culture and traditions. I'm horrified. Familiar reports spoke of men in uniform reeking of alcohol and high on other substances. Whether they were hired guns, homemade presidential red berries, or rogue soldiers, as Dadis, the unelected head of state, would have us believe, they were armed and looking for trouble. Women protesters became their target that day. The shocking trend of sexual assault on women by uniformed men wielding power had landed in Guinea that Monday. There were horrifying reports of soldiers using rifle butts, even bayonets, to rape women while other women, stripped of their clothing and their dignity, were violated, humiliated, raped. Right there in the stadium by the security forces, brazenly and brutally in broad daylight. But when I look back to my reporting of the troubles in Guinea, which had political problems and still have, I remembered the fearless, diminutive in size and a giant in courage trade union leader, labor leader, Hajar Rabiatu Sera Diallo, with her quiet authority and steely gaze staring down soldiers sent to intimidate her and other rights and labor campaigners. She courageously led marches demanding sweeping government reforms and the military back to barracks, insisting there could be no dialogue in Guinea until the state of siege, as she called it, was lifted. Aja Rabiatu warned that the army, with its unlimited powers of search and detention, was perpetrating all manner of evil, committed under the cover of darkness, and that individuals were using this time to rob others, rape women, and commit other atrocities. It has to stop, she pleaded. This is really very serious indeed. Another woman leading the way. A year later, in 2009, it was in this climate of fear, intimidation and repression described by Hajar Rabiatu that women in Guinea's capital were raped, robbed, and sexually assaulted with guns by soldiers. This is where, as a reporter, you cannot simply jet in and after being parachuted in for, say, 48 hours, do the story, cover the fallout, fly out. And I thank NPR for allowing us, NPR's reporters, the time and the space to be able to report stories deeply and fully. It's so important. So I had to find out more. Who were these women who had left their homes in the morning to attend a protest march starting at Conakry Stadium on a Monday? I'm not a full-time investigative journalist. I'm a jobbing journalist an all-purpose Africa reporter I describe myself as. I will try to turn my hand to any story. You'll find me in open-air markets, which I love, talking to the women who make Africa's economies tick and who are, for me, the real barometer of a nation and a continent. Market women in Africa are like taxi drivers here in the West. They know what's going on and have an informed opinion on almost everything that matters. I certainly listen to them. They're full of advice and timely guidance. And everybody who knows Ophelia knows I'm a bit of a shopper. <laughs> Nowhere better than the market, exchanging everything from compliments about a Nigerian batik, as I'm wearing tonight, or Senegalese, or Guinean woven fabric, or Ghanaian colorful kinte I might be wearing, or her printed wax cloth, or sometimes spontaneously exchanging gifts. I love jewelry. I love it chunky. And it's wonderful to be able to share a love of Africa's beauty, be it a design or a creative fabric. In South Africa, they call it Ubuntu, a shared humanity and sharing. Something beyond measure, but it's 
an exchange that can suddenly make what might have been a tricky interview doable. Why? Because you found a link that you have in common, and you're away. I can also be found on the front line reporting conflicts, or in the boardroom talking to the continent's women movers and shakers, creators, innovators, and inventors, or in educational institutions, urban and village settings. I'll give everything a go. Why not? You'll find me in creative spaces or sacred places, listening to women and girls and men and boys talk to us, reporters, talk to each other and to many others about their communities, the continent, the world, and what matters to them. I think to be a good reporter, you've got to be a good listener. But sometimes, as in Guinea in 2009, it isn't so simple. The horror of the shocking attacks on women who were raped in the open by soldiers affected the entire nation. But that was not the end. A number of women, some of whom I later found and spoke to, were marched off to a villa somewhere, and the horror continued. It took time to find these women going through an intermediary who was herself terrified that she would be discovered and punished. Eventually, I met some of the women in a small room in a safe house in Guinea, which is a country where it is totally shameful to talk about taboo subjects such as rape or sexual violence. So these women had not been able to discuss their ordeal with even family members, or they were too frightened to even consult doctors, yet they had been raped. One woman, a gently spoken professional, told me she was praying she hadn't been infected with HIV or wasn't pregnant after the hell she'd endured once they were taken away from the stadium. She described how the soldiers had driven them to a villa where they were drugged and didn't know where they were. She hadn't been able to discuss all this with her sister, her husband, or any family member or friend. Why, I asked. Out of shame, she replied. She only managed to escape when a soldier walked into the room, probably to join in, she said, only to realize that he knew her. He got her out. The courage of these women to share their hell with a journalist like me, someone they did not know and had never met before, was for me proof of immense and immeasurable bravery to tell others that this was happening in Guinea where the rule of law had been jettisoned, abandoned, and they felt their nation and the world must know. I know we journalists stand accused of focusing far too much on conflict, disease, poverty, the negatives about Africa that Tamika mentioned, Tamika mentioned. Mea maxima culpa. I agree. But we have to tell Africa's truths, good and bad, pretty and sad, ugly and enriching. And women are often the holders of these truths. Of course, there are many, many, many positive stories. Powerful, influential, inspiring, strong, creative, resourceful, resilient, charming, compassionate, fabulous African women and girls abound. African crown jewels, they are treasures. And they're taking the world by storm, or, or quietly, getting things done and making a difference and a change to the lives of girls, women, boys, and men. Girls are coding and they're loving it and building smartphone apps that help reunite children who've got lost, reuniting them with their families. Women innovators in Africa are making a difference 24 seven, be it in technology, the arts, music, literature, publishing, they're setting up bespoke chocolate enterprises on the continent where most of the world's cocoa, probably used to make your favorite chockey bar, is produced. 
Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana are some examples. They're doing even more. Take the 2011 Nobel Peace joint winners, Africa's first elected female president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf from Liberia, and her compatriot, Lema Bowie, who led the Women in White protest campaign and marches during Liberia's protracted civil war, civil wars, in fact. Or another Nobel Peace laureate, the late Kenyan environmental and political activist, Wangari Maathai, who campaigned tirelessly for a better Kenya and Africa. Then there are the names you may not know so well. National treasures like Hawa Magaji, a psychosocial counselor from Northeast Nigeria. She comes from Chibok, a town you've probably heard of, where the mass abduction of nearly 300 schoolgirls by the extremist group Boko Haram happened back in 2014. Awa Magaji moved from Chibok to Meiduguri, the regional hub in the Northeast, to help young girls and women, many barely in their teens at the time they were captured and sexually enslaved by Boko Haram, to help them reintegrate into society. Many of these women and young, young teens are being rejected or marginalized by their families and communities when they return with babies fathered by Boko Haram fighters. Their babies are dubbed Boko Haram babies and they Boko Haram wives. Talking of Chibok, in my almost 35 years as a reporter, one of the most uplifting assignments I can remember to date was covering students who were abducted from their girls boarding school dorms in Chibok, reuniting with their families in Abuja, Nigeria last year. Here's one such photo. Not half an hour earlier, we were trying to comfort her. She couldn't find her parents. So many of the other young women who had been released were hugging and crying. She said, my parents are dead, my parents are dead. She was hysterical, thinking that her parents were dead. They said to her, no, they've just had a problem with the car. They're on their way, they're on their way. And when she saw her parents, she sank to the ground, weeping. And half an hour later, there she was with her friends. They were singing and dancing, and look at her. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary event, watching this reunion. Sometimes as a reporter, luck is on your side, and you're in the right place at the right time. I was lucky that day, happened to be in Abuja, and to cover this remarkable, remarkable story of families who had been through pain, the agony of separation. It ended there, the tears, fathers, mothers, daughters, hugging and weeping and weeping and hugging. There was barely a dry eye, me included. After three years with barely any contact, families were reunited in relief and thanksgiving. The joy was palpable. Everyone present felt blessed. But spare a thought for Leah Sharibu, who was 15 when she was abducted from Dapshi Girls Technical College in Northeast Nigeria earlier this year. Dozens of her fellow students were bundled off by Boko Haram. President Muhammad Buhari's government negotiated an early release of most of the abducted girls, but we are told that Leah Sharibu, the only Christian among mainly Muslim girls kidnapped, refused to renounce Christianity. While the others have been released, Leah has not. When we traveled to Dabshi on assignment in March, we met Leah's mother, Rebecca. We only found out that her daughter had been abducted in Dabshi when we sat down on a mat in the dusty square in front of the Emir's palace with a group of women and mothers from the community to find out more. Leah is still missing. So my advice is take the time to talk. 
you will make contacts that may prove to be invaluable, as in this case of the Sharibu family. We've kept in touch with Mr. and Mrs. Sharibu. Just last week, the Nigerian president called up Leah's mother to again pledge that he will do all he can to bring her daughter back safely from Boko Haram captivity. Working your contacts is crucial, but it makes such a difference when you have met the person with whom you're talking about sensitive, painful, often difficult topics. This portrait of reporting on women and girls in Africa is somewhat scattershot. I've picked on some of the examples that have stayed with me of why I find it's critical to reflect the importance of women and girls in Africa. I guess I gravitate towards them because there are so many untold stories, perhaps because we, the reporters, don't dig deep enough. A couple of years ago, I met documentary photographer and chronicler Fatih Abubakar in Meidugri, the birthplace of Boko Haram and the capital of Borno State in Northeast Nigeria. She trained as a nurse and worked as a nurse. Fatih said she was frustrated and fed up with out-of-towners like me, I didn't take it personally though, painting such a negative picture of her home state and its ties with the extremist group. So she set up on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and posts extraordinary portraits of Borno under the hashtag bits of Borno. She photographs random people, children, she says they make her smile, women, men, you name it. Fatih Abubakar is determined to give us a rounded picture of Borno that she says the local and international media neglect, choosing to focus on bomb blasts, suicide attacks, death and destruction. It's wonderful to watch Fatih at work. She's dainty and wears long, colorful, elegant dresses with her camera slung over her shoulder, squatting and leaning perilously close to a railing separating her and the road from a three-foot plunge into a trash dump. She's inspiring. She doesn't seem to see it. She just bends down her skirts in the dust and snap, 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 snap. Then out comes her notebook, note, 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 note. And then she posts these extraordinary pictures. Hashtag bits of Bono, look her up. Let me conclude with an assignment in South Africa in April this year that could have been sorrowful if it hadn't been such a celebration of the remarkable life of Winnie Madikizela Mandela, mourners female and male, adults and children were everywhere and they were weeping openly. In many ways, the Winnie story crystallizes precisely why the voices of women and girls matter. It was extraordinary to witness on the ground after she died, the full impact and effect of her influence and inspiration over the years. Women and girls, especially black South African young women and girls, just burst forth with grief and gratitude, thanking Winnie Mandela for her enormous contribution to the struggle for freedom in South Africa, despite the negatives and the lows in her life when there were many. Almost every girl and woman I spoke to talked about what Winnie Madikizela Mandela meant to them. They said they now understood what it is to be a woman in South Africa, in Africa, living in a mainly predominantly patriarchal society. Movements mushroomed, and especially for younger women, the passing of Winnie Madikizela Mandela spurred the mantra, she didn't die she multiplied. They donned dukes, head wraps, as they're called in South Africa, that Madikizela Mandela made her trademark and joined the hashtag I am Winnie movement. Wearing a fetching and simple Winnie style head tie when I met her outside 
Mrs. Madikizela Mandela Soweto home, a 22-year-old student, Neo Ngobo, said she had joined the flourishing unofficial movements. Mama Wini didn't die. She did indeed multiply, said Neo, adding, because what she left us with is the spirit to fight for what we want as women, especially as young women. Neo said there were many challenges facing young South Africans, but that Winnie Mandela had given all young women the inspiration to get up and fight for what they really want in life. Women empowerment, she said, and lifting each other up. This, said Neo, is exactly what we mean by she did not die, she multiplied. Neo's shy 10-year-old sister, Andy Siwe, was also proudly wearing a Winnie Duke and said she too was inspired as a South African girl, adding, I respect and love her. Rest in peace, Mama. And the incredibly articulate 22-year-old Neo, I mean, it just summed up what the feeling in South Africa, in Johannesburg, during Winnie Mandela's funeral and that period. Young women were standing up and saying, our voices must be heard. And then you have this 10-year-old also adding her contribution. In a eulogy to her mother during her funeral, Winnie Mandela's daughter, Zenani Mandela Dlamini, made a point of thanking young South Africans, especially young women, saying, saying as a family, they had watched in awe as young women stood up and took a stand of deep solidarity with their mother, who had been judged, she said, by much harsher standards than her male counterparts. A dear South African friend, the BBC's Audrey Brown, with whom I covered Winnie Mandela's funeral, put it this way. She said, an understanding of how Winnie, as they call her there, was terrorized as a woman alone, a young woman alone, and slandered as a beautiful woman, came roaring out of the grief people felt at her passing. There's something pretty special about witnessing history and reporting it. And there's something equally special about recording what women and girls have to say about it all. I guess that's why I do the job I do. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful comments, inspiring and wise. Uh, thank you, Ephebia. And thank you to the Radcliffe Institute for giving me the honor and the pleasure to speak with, honestly, a, 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 an old dear friend and one of my favorite people in the whole world. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, so we've known each other a long time. Um, I want to get personal in a second, but I just want to pick up on a couple of things that you said uh, uh, in your talk. Um, the women in Guinea that you spoke with, I mean, there are very few people who can go in a room and sit down with women who've been through that kind of trauma, with, with anybody who's been through that kind of trauma, uh, and get them to open up. Uh, you talked about their courage, but I think, especially in this day and age, when journalists uh, are not really appreciated by governments around the world, it takes a lot of courage to A, go in uh, to speak with them. But also, I want to know how you kind of frame your, home, your own attitude and your own psyche, because not everybody can go in that room and get the kind of responses that you get. So what is it about you, Ophebia, that allows people these women, these girls, uh, who've been through so much, traumatized to the point that life itself seems futile, what do you do 
what do you say to get them to open up? And what is it about you that makes them talk? Well, you don't, one thing you don't do is you don't breeze in and say, I've got 10 minutes. Cough up. No, I mean, this is why I say you really got to take time. Before I met the women, before I met them to interview them, I had been there a few hours. I had been there the, the day before. You, people have got to get used to you. They don't know you. What do they know? What, they don't know what you're going to be saying. So I, you know, Marco, I, I met some of the students from the colleges at lunchtime. And I said, I think the most important thing is you've got to be, you've got to show compassion. You've got to show compassion. If you're only interested in these women or girls or men or boys because of the story you're going to get, they may not speak to you. People are instinctive. They know if you're only coming for a story or if you really care about what they have been through. So some people weren't able to give their full story. There was one woman who talked in the third person. She was in the stadium, and she talked as if she had seen someone else being violated and raped. And the, the go-between who helped me set up these interviews later said to me, she was actually talking about herself, but she's so ashamed about this taboo. And there were other women around. She didn't want them to know she had been raped. You, if, you, if you don't empathize, what's the point? If I, I, somebody said to me, well, don't you get empathy fatigue? I said, the day I have empathy fatigue, I stop being a reporter. I mean, that's a great bar to hold up, but I mean, so much of journalism is about competition and getting it first, but getting it right, but getting it first. Um, nobody talks about get it first, get it right, and be compassionate and empathetic along the way. So how many people are, how many journalists in Africa have all those qualities? Oh, Marco, how do I know? <laughs> I think you have a lot, of, a lot of compassionate journalists. But you also have those who just go for the jugular and are not really interested in, and, and I think it maybe shows in the reporting. They may get stock answers. They may get answers that you might expect. But if you give people time to get to know you a little, and I'm not saying they're going to know me for a month or three months, no. But even for a full day or a week, people get a bit more comfortable, and then they feel that they can tell you more because hopefully they trust you a little. It's so important. I, you know, I put myself in their positions. Would I talk to somebody I didn't know? If it was Marco and I knew him, I would feel confident. But somebody who comes out of nowhere asking you such personal questions. I think, you know, we owe it to those people who are sharing such intimate and difficult details with us to give them that compassion. I mean, I know it's no problem for you when you go to the back of the mob and you find the women in the marketplace. I mean, I've seen you in the field. I've seen you in action. You're just a natural. I mean, I mean you are one of them. Do you see it that way? Uh, you, of course I am, because I'm an African woman. But I think more importantly, you, I mean, you can do all the reporting from here with the people in the front row. But what about those at the back? If you only interview people in the front row, you'll get front row comments the whole time. But if you dig a bit deeper and go to, you'll see people that you wouldn't perhaps even expect to be listening to what's going on, because they're busy, as I said. But they're there. And sometimes you say hello, you sit down, you ask after their family and their children, and brrrr. Maybe they say this is somebody who's actually interested in, hmm. in me and in my life and in my family. So you, you brought up the fact that the Nobel Peace Prize this week went to Dr. Dennis Mukwege and uh, to Nadia Murad uh, for their work uh, fighting uh, rape as a weapon of war. Um, and uh, in Dr. Mukwege's case, uh, Dr. Miracle, I mean, his uh, ability to uh, not only as a surgeon, but also to bring these women back around from trauma. Um, and 
your talk was about women, but I want to know about men in Africa and how many men are looking at somebody like Dr. Denny Mukwege and are saying, I want to be like him, I want to be a better man for women. What, how many men do you find in Africa who are leaning in that direction? I know this is a massive generalization. I know you don't like generalizations, so I'm going to put you on the spot anyway. Where do men stand on this, and how are men changing? The rapists see him as a threat, and not just the rapists. The government of Congo, they don't like Denis Mukwege. He had to hot-foot it out of eastern Congo because of threats on his life and the life of his family. His bodyguard was killed. But was that because he was essentially trying, kind of a, a, a sop against fighters in the military and they didn't like that, or because he was focusing on helping women? Both. Both. Of course there are men who sympathize, many men. They may not come out and say it, and there again, Marco, maybe that's for me to go and find out from them. What do you think of the work of Denis Mukwege? Do you feel it enhances the community? Or do you feel that it brings shame to the community that this has happened? Of course I speak to men. I speak to young men. I speak to older men. I just think that they get more of a voice in Africa, in fact, all over the world, than women and girls. So I make a special effort to hear more from women and girls. But I speak to men. I speak to them about difficult subjects. I speak to them, I spoke to men after the rapes in Guinea. I mean, some of them couldn't stop the tears from flowing because they witnessed it too. It wasn't just women who saw women being raped. What do you do when you can't help somebody who's being violated? You must feel not only helpless, but in a way redundant. Why couldn't I help? Why couldn't I grab a machete or a bayonet and stop the soldiers from doing what they were doing? We do come from patriarchal societies, so men are expected to protect, be it a woman, be it children. So it's, it's a tough call. Let's update the situation in Chibok just briefly, because you um, talked about how joyous a celebration was, the reuniting of these girls with their families. Um, you spoke briefly about how some of these girls are being rejected, their children that they uh, birthed after being impregnated by the Boko Haram militants, how they're being rejected. Uh, we recently on the program spoke with uh, Adobe Trisha Wabani about uh, some of the girls who are now at university and getting these bourses, but they're also having trouble. So where does this all go? Where are these, I mean, what's the life, what does life look like for these girls in we'll the future? We'll only know in the future, Marco. Those who are able to go back to education, at least they will have an education. And I spoke only briefly, but I have reported at length on, on young women. They're no longer girls, because they're 18, 19, 20. Right. But if you go back five years when they were abducted, they were 13, 14, 15. They, because those who have children often say that has saved them. Because even though their families, even though the community may reject them, they have someone to love, and they have someone to protect. But I don't think they're under any illusions that life mm. is going to be difficult. Do, do they, are there social workers and psychologists that, I, that attend to them? Because I know a lot of people that I met in Africa rejected talk therapy, but uh, Dr. McQuaggy's experience shows that it's obviously helpful as a, in, a, in a universal kind of context. Indeed, and Hawam Gaji, who I spoke about, the right. psychosocial counselor, yeah. who moved from Chibok, where she comes from, to, it, these are precisely the African men and women who are trying to help, not only the young women reintegrate into society, but the communities to accept them, saying, you can't punish them twice. They didn't ask to be raped. They didn't ask to be abducted by Boko Haram. Look what they have been through. If anything, we, the community, should be welcoming them with open arms and saying sorry. So they're working with those who have been affected and have survived, and also with those 
who were finding it difficult to accept these, and not just young women, sometimes children. Mm. I've met it, yeah. Because they're seen as being tainted by Boko Haram. So it's tough. And you have other organizations like the Neem Foundation. There is a Nigerian psychologist who trained outside, and she said she got into psychology because of the big cases that were happening here in the US and, and Britain. And she was with the government, the previous government now has set up this foundation. They're trying, but it's difficult because these are such taboo subjects that a lot of people don't want to touch them. Bring back our girls, big hashtag. What about Me Too as a hashtag, as a movement? What does that mean to the women and girls that you've met in the last year? Women in urban areas have caught on because everybody is, uh, everybody is on social media, except Ophemia. Yeah. Everybody. This is true. It's maddening, <laughs> but it's true. Everybody is on social media. So this, in a different way, I think Me Too has had an effect. In many African countries, I, I think it has given, especially young women, a voice to stand up and say, no, we're not going to put up with this. And that really maybe isn't the African way. You don't challenge your elders because of the respect factor. And I think respect is good. Mm. But now more questions are being asked. More pressure is being put on people who use power in this way. And young people are saying no. But on the other hand, you have the phenomenon of the sugar daddy, other names, who are financing young women who are maybe at university or college or even school, That's financing very their studies. Yeah. So if you, you know, it, it's, it's a real contradiction because you have Me Too and we stand up for our rights. But if somebody is paying your education for sex, so it's a tough one, unresolved. Um. I should say that uh, Ophebia and I have known each other since 1987, and it's not like you went to Africa uh, uh, and carved out this niche of women and girls for yourself. Um, the first time we met was on the phone uh, a couple of months after Captain Thomas Sankara had been killed as president of Burkina Faso, and uh, Ophebia was hosting uh, Network Africa, the breakfast show for the African continent on the BBC World Service. And uh, I was the AP stringer in Ouagadougou, and you wanted to do an interview on a piece of cloth that was going around, Les Larmes de Mariam, the tears of Mariam, the widow of Thomas Sankara, Ma Mariam Sankara. And it was a, a shocking coup d'etat. Nobody had ever seen a bloody coup d'etat in ex Revolta, Burkina Faso before. Uh, and so people were really scared to speak out. And one of the ways they spoke out was through cloth. Wearing this. This cloth was peppers. Specially printed cloth. Little yeah. peppers, and it looked like tears. So it was called The Tears of Mariam, and that's when we spoke. But I want to kind of pick up there uh, because we want to know the more personal side of Ophebia. You know, we know Dakar. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. Come on. I mean. Shall I tell you how that started? It was just. <laughs> you know, there's Dakar, Bangladesh. Then there's Dakar, Senegal. Well, people were saying it as if it was the same capital. And I said, no, hell no. I'm, I'm happy to report from Dhaka, Bangladesh, but that's not where I am. So I think I started emphasizing. And the rest is history. <laughs> it's a wonderful city. Come and visit. Lovely place to live, yeah. So there's the reporter that we Americans know, um, and then there's the other Ophebia. And I just want to dive into that Ophebia for a couple of minutes, because uh, with the exception of my friends Payne and Kakra from, from college, you were the first Afropolitan who I'd ever met, you know, born uh, in Accra, yes. Oxford. Ox born in Oxford, <laughs> by, moved back by to Accra. Yeah. Rome, mm -hmm. London. Uh, you're comfortable in many worlds. Um, so just tell me about um, your life. You're born into this uh, post-colonial world, not even barely. Um, where? When did you first get to Africa, and how much back and forth did you do between Accra and Europe? Let me just up? say, for a start, it doesn't matter where you're brought up in the world, if you've got Ghanaian parents, you're going to be brought up Ghanaian. <laughs> so, 
It didn't matter that we lived in Rome, that I was born in Oxford. You, there are certain Ghanaian things, and you don't uh, deviate from those. And actually, no, it's been really good, because it gives you roots and an identity, which is really important. So although we've lived in different places, and I've worked in different places, you know, I, I never have to think twice if somebody asks me, where are you from? Mm. You know, Ghana's back home. Dakar is Dakar base. London is other home. Uh, Cambridge is other home. <laughs> but you, you did, know. I mean, you were traveling a lot, though, as a, as a girl. I mean, yeah. to Nairobi, all over the place. It's true, but we yeah. went to school in Britain, so right. there was that continuity. Yeah. You know, Ghanaians, Ghana being, I was born a year after, I'm 60. Yeah, I turned 60 in August. So I, was, so I was born a year after the end of, colo you know, the colonial rule in Britain. And, you, I mean, of course I was a baby, but from the stories we hear, it was such a happy time getting freedom. So we then went back home. So I did my nursery school, would have been. And then we went off to live in Rome. And then Your father Nairobi. worked for my forestry father worked for the under UN. Nkrumah, yeah. Yeah? but then went to He was to the Rome. first yeah. chief conservator yeah. of forests. So I guess that gives me my love of wood. Yeah. <laughs> I did, well, I did, it didn't sort of click for a long while, but I, you know, I love wood. I know we're meant to be conserving it. Yeah. But um, Especially I did. Especially the tropical yes, woods, right? Indeed. Yeah. So, yeah, it was. But we were because we were a family unit wherever. It didn't really matter where we were. And then going home every two years to Ghana on home leave meant that we caught up. My mother was the eldest of our late mother was the eldest of ten children. So, you know, we're about 50-odd cousins, give or take. Yeah, and we had a grandmother we all adored. So all we all wanted to do was congregate at her home. And, you know, Ghana has always been back home. Your, your father was in public service. I know your aunt, uh, Therese, was ambassador to Rome and Paris and the Vatican. Did you ever think about doing government or some sort of public service as opposed to journalism? I wanted to be a diplomat. I thought either diplomat or interpreter. When I saw the booths the interpreters had to, I said, no, that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's not for me. And I think I might have gone the route of uh, the foreign service, but Ghana at the time was a military leadership, and of course, you represent your government. I didn't feel I could quite do that, plus I come from a political family, so right. I thought, you know, you're weaned on the BBC, if your parents are expatriates from most of Africa. No, World Service. And it was just, yeah, the BBC World Service. So that was the background noise. And I thought, well, maybe I could do that. And that's how it Worked came to be. Worked out pretty well. Um, I'm going to open it up to the floor, but I have one more question. And I know this is like so, uh, such American exceptionalism. Let's talk about the United States for a second. But I, <laughs> I, I'm going to do it because you were the world's first roving American correspondent, I think it was a fantastic experiment, and I think now more than ever we need that kind of, would you come back and work yeah. for us again? I'm, it's, it's just a play <laughs> um, for that. Um, but I, I think of the demonization of a free press right now, the, the laissez-faire kind of attitude toward rules governing conflict of interest and nepotism, corruption writ large, uh, and not to mention the casual attitudes toward women's place in the world, um, we're also watching the U.S.-Saudi relationship come to some sort of inflection point with the dis disappearance and sad possibility that uh, Jamal Khashoggi has been killed um, and what that's going to do to uh, Trump and the Saudi uh, monarchy. And it doesn't look like Trump is rushing to pick up the phone to find out what happened. So how much of this modeling in the White House right now uh, do you think is seeping into African politics and how, how empowering is it for authoritarians in Africa to see what's happening with Trump in the White House right now? You know, I think if you talk to African people, they're wondering what's going on here. It, it, this isn't the America they know. And a lot of the things happening, people say, well, hang on, if that's happening where we come from, there's criticism. But I think President Trump is probably a fillet for a lot of African leaders who want to do it their way, come what may. Regardless, people, although President Trump has only been in power for two years, you have Paul Bia in Cameroon. He's 85. Five, yeah. He was back in elections at the weekend. Yeah. And you those know. monitors from Transparency were uh, crisis actors, apparently. You, I mean, you, so 
People who aren't leaders who are not being criticized, I think are pretty happy with President Trump. You know, apart from his one something whole country's comment and a few others, there hasn't been much said. But if his eyes go to you and he doesn't like what you're doing, you know, hey, watch out because he speaks his mind. But for those who are trashing their countries with poor leadership, and you know, you mentioned things like corruption and cupidity, they're thinking, oh, this isn't somebody who's gonna dictate those things to us. He wants to talk about trade. He says his friends have done some pretty good business deals in Africa. That's the sort of thing they want to hear. But let's see how things pan out. But there are lots of question marks about the US right now. I think people are a little destabilized, yeah. you know? Everywhere. All right, my friends, the floor is open to you. The microphone is here. Please step up uh, and uh, make your questions succinct, please. Uh, thank you very much for this quite inspiring talk. I brought my students here from the School of Divinity. So we are going to talk about uh, the journalist as uh, an ethnographer when we get, uh, get back next week. So thanks for that background. I'd like you to um, respond to an issue that I think it's very central to your conversation. A group of Africans are saying that we don't want the ICC in Hague to abdicate matters relating to some of the, the crisis that we're faced with. Uh, governments who are, you know, are protecting soldiers, who are raping women, and so on and so forth. They are calling for an African ICC, and Ghana has been suggested as a possible place to build it. So when a person like you who is so passionate about Africa is faced with this type of dilemma of you know, the African identity, the idea that it has to be African, at the same time we realize that at the end of the day it's going to be something we may call police investigation of police conduct because we are not sure that justice will be done if such cases are brought to an African ICC court. So how do you, as a journalist, deal with similar situations, or even this particular one, caught between wanting to be faithful to one's own nation and, and legitimate you know, complaints about ICC being pretty pro-European, but at the same time wanting, knowing fully well, that if they do this, there's going to be a serious problem. What's the re response to that? I think Africa is capable of having its own continental court to try tyrants, to try those who violate human rights. But the problem, I think, is that African governments change. So now you may have a quorum and you may have uh, leaders who will not interfere. But what about a few years down the road? I know the International Criminal Court has issues and has problems. And there are many criticisms, especially from Africans, that it just picks on Africans. But its justification is that it has to be asked by an African country to try, say, Laurent Gbagbo in Côte d'Ivoire. Then you have those who are the former president of Côte d'Ivoire. You have those who say, well, they pick on their enemies and send them to the ICC. So it's a difficult one because I think we have come of age. You know, we have judges who are, of course, able to try cases. Look at the example of Isen Abre, the former president of Chad, who was held responsible for atrocities and uh, war crimes. That happened at a special international court sitting in Dakar, Senegal. So there are examples of where it does work. But whether there is the continental goodwill amongst African leaders is really the issue. But I'm not sure that I'm 100% with you that such an African court will fail. I think it has to be given a chance. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, uh, my name is Nick Diamond, and I have spent time interviewing um, gay men and uh, lesbian women in Dakar, Senegal. Um, and 
I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of advice uh, for other journalists and those in the room who are um, interviewing vulnerable populations like women and girls that you spoke about in terms of um, safeguarding their uh, safety and security when you're conducting these, these types of interviews. I think it's really important. As you know, you say you've been in Senegal, which is a, a very conservative in a positive sense country. But when it comes to LGBT issues, almost everywhere you go in Africa, there's pushback. And especially people saying, the West can't dictate to us. We have our own mores, we have our own values, and we're going to stick to them. And you have countries like South Africa that have very liberal constitutions, where you, know, you have what they call corrective rape, that uh, gay women are being forced to have sex with men because they say, no, women can't be lesbians. We'll correct it by showing you that a man can make you happy. I think it's really important to keep the identities, uh, unless they and even if they choose to speak out in the open, because there is such, I wouldn't say it's hatred, but there, there's such denial on the continent about almost everything LGBT, that people say, no, this is un-African. Why are you bringing this from abroad? But those who are willing to speak out and let people know, their stories must be told, but it's not always going to be possible to, I know the normal journalistic routine is that you give people's names, but to protect people's security, I think it's important to keep their anonymity if it, if it means that they're going to be in any danger at all. How long were you in Senegal? Uh, nine months. Nine months. Yeah. Okay, sorry we didn't meet there. That's Come okay. back. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. thank you. Hi, I want to thank you both very much for being here. And I listen to the world every day, Marco. It's wonderful <laughs> to see you. Thank you. Last week, I saw a documentary on HBO called Queen of the World. And it was a celebration of Queen Elizabeth of England and the fact that she brings 53 countries who are part of the Commonwealth to the UK. And the way that this documentary was slanted, it was all this big celebration and we're all a big family. And there was no mention of the exploitative nature of colonialism and imperialism and racism. And I, I was kind of appalled that it was such an unbalanced film. So I don't know if you saw it, but because you are a, a daughter of Ghana, I just would like to know what do you think about the Commonwealth and are we drinking the Kool-Aid here? <laughs> <laughs> when you said Queen of the World, I thought you were talking about a documentary perhaps of Miriam Makeba. <laughs> it, my point exactly. <laughs> I, a, a little reveal here too. One of one of your many names is Regina. Ah, that's your true. Christian My Christian name. 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 There we go. I I didn't see it. I've just I've just got into town. You know, I think it's good to maintain links. Colonialism was globally bad for Africa, but some good things perhaps have come out of it. I'm surprised to hear of a film that was so uncritical. It really surprised me as well. I think it's a British production. It didn't even seem like a typical HBO documentary. Uh -huh. I think they probably just acquired it. But I'm sure it's running on On Demand. You should check it out right. because <laughs> but I, I, I don't consider Queen Elizabeth the queen of the world. Yeah. But that's the name of the show. And you know, there uh, has to be a bit of honesty. The, the Commonwealth has become, if not redundant, it's, it's I don't know whether its days are numbered, but I, I think it does some good things. But how much do Americans know about the British Commonwealth, as was, anymore? You know, when we were in the 80s, the Commonwealth seemed to be quite a powerful, influential voice. But it seems to be pairing off and slipping away. Uh, you know, I wasn't born under colonialism. Our forefathers brought us freedom. And I'm very grateful for that, because I've had a good life. But I think people should be honest about what went on during the colonial years. Reparations, that's another question altogether. Thank you.
Okay, let me try it this way. Um, my name is Roberta Logan. I live in Dorchester, which is the African-American community of Boston. And there are people who live beyond that, but I live right in the heart. Um, and my question, since you've spoken well and thoroughly about the young women of Boko Haram and the young women who have been affected by rape through war, um, but what are the rest of the girls thinking about? What are the girls in Senegal thinking about? What are your nieces and nephews, well, your nieces talking about? What are their joys and what are their concerns? They're talking about becoming coders. Tech seems to be taking over the youth in Africa. They are rapping in Wolof or Chi or uh, Swahili. They, you know, young people are hugely confident, which I think is extraordinary. They feel, you know, we can be a bit hangdog when we get to our age, this and that, groaning, moaning. No, no, no. They feel their future is bright. And they don't feel, as perhaps in our day, that it's bright if you go to the US or if you go to Britain or if you go to Europe. Now, China. Opportunity knocks. Or stay right home and build at home. They do feel that they are the leaders. They feel that it's time for us to move over and let them take over because they feel confident that they are the leaders Africa needs now for Africa really to be propelled into the 21st century in all its magnificence. So young, not only young girls, young boys. I love talking to them. I should interview them more. I was talking, chatting with the students earlier and saying the voices of young people are so important because they give another perspective. It was like that parting the waters to talk to those who are at the back. The people at the front will have one view. The young people at the back will say, no, that, you can't speak for us, not on this subject. We know better than you. So marvelous things happening. I could carry this on for ages, but I'm going to let the next person speak. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for all your remarks. It's been really wonderful to, to see you in person. Um, my name is Sue Tallingator. I'm a doctoral student here, and I also lived in Senegal for six years. Nagadef. Ah, lots of <laughs> magnifique. I don't want to Magnifique. <laughs> um, I'm doing my research on, and I think this is good news, um, female parliamentarians in Senegal and South Africa. Female? Parliamentarians uh -huh. in Senegal and South Africa. And as you know, across the continent, because of the quota systems, a number of women have infused previously patriarchal governments mm -hmm. and you know, are starting, at least my research is showing, are starting to make a difference um, in terms of the leadership in their country. And you know, here in the US, we're kind of on the brink of maybe a few more women getting involved in, in the government. But I'm just wondering your thoughts on female leadership um, and in public service in Africa, not necessarily the presidents, but, but the people who are actually in the government, you know, uh, and women's voices that are in the government, what your impressions are. I would say government, one thing, leadership, another. I mean, there's no, there's no question that women make Africa tick. I mean, for me, that, and it's, they may not m make a big deal about it, but it's happening. From market traders, to those who run businesses, to those who run homes, there's no doubt that it's happening. But more and more, in the years I've been covering Africa, I'm hearing more and more women's voices, women speaking out, because you've had women in parliaments all over for quite a while, South Africa, as you know, Rwanda, Ghana, getting a few more. But Often they don't speak out, it's the men who speak out, but that is changing. And not just about uh, issues that, uh, issues of women and children and gender and so on, about other issues. Women are speaking out and uh, their voices are being heard, but they don't always feel that the public forum is the place to speak. They feel that sometimes they're more influential talking behind the scenes. But I think that's changing, and I think the younger generation don't feel that way at all. They feel their voice is just as important and must be heard. So that's a good thing. Thank you. 
Um, we've got time for one more. We've got two people. Angola-sized question or two Togo-sized questions. <laughs> Right. Hello, my name is Bonnie. I'm an undergraduate at Harvard, and I was really excited to hear that you would be speaking today, and I'm so glad that I got to come. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, the economic um, changes that have been going on in Africa. My family is from Ethiopia, and we got to visit back home this summer for the first time, and it was really eye-opening to see a lot of my cousins who I have cousins who are living in urban areas and in more rural areas. And I can see in my family that lives in more urban areas the changes that you were talking about, about technology and um, the openness of opportunities and the willingness to stay in the country and make differences there. But I was just wondering if you had anything to say about the opportunities available to girls, especially in the rural areas, because those opportunities are often more limited simply because of logistics, money, and so on in a more dramatic way than they are limited by the, by the, um, the parts of Africa that are um, more urbanized and fortunate in these growing economic times. I, I can't talk globally, mm -hmm. but I think rural Africa is an untapped resource. And I think st still Ethiopia being an example, although, although there have been rapid changes in Ethiopia this year that people can hardly believe politically, which is going to open up the country. I think you do have, because, because in the countryside, young boys and girls are part of farming, for example. Mm -hmm. Getting them to school is an issue. And these days, without formal education, it's hard to advance in the urban areas. So I think that is a, a real problem, and not just in Ethiopia, in many African countries where not only girls but boys are not going to school, although there's meant to be universal primary school education because they're needed to tend the fields or to tend the cattle. How do we change that? I think it comes through leadership. Mm -hmm. And it'll be interesting to see whether in Ethiopia that will change. You know, everybody is all smiles with the new prime minister who seems to be making a difference, you know, reaching out to Eritrea, for example, and making peace. But what will it mean for ordinary Ethiopians in the long run, especially people in the rural areas? I guess we're going to have to find out. But it is, it remains a problem. I would like to add on, do you think it would be an economic solution or a more education-focused solution? I think both. Okay, thank you. And one more. Oh. Oh, that was it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Please join me in thanking. <laughs>